All right, this is NCCR Electrical 3 Distribution Equipment um, Lecture. So, Distribution Equipment, page one, trade terms. I've got um, air circuit breakers for you guys that are working in factories already and stuff. You go to your motor control centers or your MCCs. These are like your, your circuit breakers that are in there, like the big circuit breakers. Um, if you've ever had to like pump up or, or charge is what it's called, uh, a breaker, like large, larger breaker. It's called, it's, it's for um, lower voltage, but remember, there's no set, set standard on low voltage. Like a lot of people say 1,000, a lot of people say 600. Um, so still a higher amount of voltage. These are the circuit breakers that can handle opening up uh, large amounts of voltage and current. Um, you, you need to know what's your BIL, your basic impulse insulation level. The maximum impulse voltage the winding insulation can withstand without failure. So that'd be for like your mo motors and stuff like that. Bus bars, uh, we've talked about those in the past. You should learn uh, the main place where you should have learned that there's bus bars is in residential. You've got, um, you take off all the breakers off a panel and you got two or three bus bars in the back usually. Um, and it's, it's, just a, it's just a way of transporting current um, other than a wire. So it's just, it's just bars can, can uh, transfer a lot more current than, than just a smaller wire. Um, current transformer, probably talked about a bunch, like those are just used to um, sense how much current is going through a, a wire. It's the same thing. It's, it works on the same principle or the um, like amp probes. If you ever have an amp probe, those work on the same um, theory. Like you clamp your amp probe around um, the wire, tells you how much current is flowing through it. Same thing. They're, they're used with GFCI um, outlets. Uh, they're also used with like air circuit breakers. Like that's what tells the air circuit breaker when, when it needs to trip. Um, distribution transformers. Um, you just need to note the transformers are measured in KVA, um, just changing uh, voltage up or down based on, on the needs. You should know what feeder is. Um, PTs are important to know, potential transformer, um, and you need to know the difference between switch board and switch gear. So a switch board is a large single panel frame or assembly of panels on which the sides, fuses, buses, and instruments are mounted. Switch gear is a general term covering switching or interrupting devices and any combination thereof with associated control, instrumentation, metering, protective, and regulating devices. Uh, so that's everything for page one. Um, Nothing on page one I have highlighted, but but those trade terms are are good to note. Moving on to page two, my first highlight is in the first paragraph on page two, the one that starts with the NEC. So like the third sentence in NEC covers low voltage systems rated up to a thousand volts, while medium voltage refers to systems rated above a thousand volts and up to thirty five thousand volts. So you need to know NEC. Um, specifies low voltage is a thousand and lower medium voltage is a thousand to thirty five thousand one 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 applications first sentence in applications is highlighted switchboards are used in modern distribution systems to subdivide large blocks of electrical power so like power would come into switchboards switchboards can um, separated in, in whatever plant you're working into um, so that different parts of the plant can, can it's like it's like having a pie cutting cutting um, your total up and sending it to different places around the plant. Um, the switchboard um, is what will do that. Um, switchboard components. I don't have highlights in the first set of bullet points, but um, they're good to note that first set of bullet points, like the typical switchboard components, uh, circuit breakers, fuses, motor starters, ground fault systems, instrument transformers, switchboard metering, control power transformers, and bus bars, all, all important. Um, that next set of bullet points I do have highlighted, along with the, the sentence that's right above it. The four general classifications of circuit breakers are as follows. Uh, you have air circuit breakers, oil circuit breakers, vacuum circuit breakers, gas circuit breakers, and, and mostly the, um, you're going to have different circuit breakers for different purposes. Um, 
but a lot of it is going to have to do with extinguishing that arc. So whenever a breaker opens up, um, it creates an arc. Um, if you have a like, if you have a vacuum circuit breaker, that can that can um, um, the arc won't last as long. Um, stuff like that. And gas is kind of the same way. Like fill it with an inert gas, where nothing's gonna there's not going to be any kind of combustible um, stuff inside that breaker. Um, yeah, moving on to page three, um, you've got how circuit breakers are rated. So the um, first three bullet points on page three are, are how these circuit breakers are kind of um, what the main thing they, they can do and, and what they're rated at. I have rated current highlighted. This is the continuous current that the circuit breaker can carry without exceeding a standard temperature rise, usually 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you have the interrupting rating I've highlighted. Um, remember, this is this is all these are important, but this is very important that interrupting is is how much current that that the circuit breaker can can open up with or or um, disconnect. This is the maximum value of current at rated voltage that the circuit breaker is required to successfully interrupt for a limited number of operations under specified conditions. The term is usually applied to abnormal or emergency conditions. Um, just like whenever I worked at, at Goodyear, if any of y'all have messed with these before, um, these are big breakers. Like they're, um, you can't like pick them up yourself, or a lot of them you can't for this, for um, the switch gear and stuff like that. Like you're carrying around with a forklift and, and we would have to have people come in and test these. Um, like if it was in, in service for a couple years, they would pull one out, put the spare in, and then this one would go to testing to make sure that it's gonna open up under, um, under load and, and under um, a maximum current rating and stuff like that and make sure that they worked like every, I think it was every two years we had to get each one tested. So we had, um, I think every four months we would we would pull a few, they'd get tested while we put the spares in and so on and so forth. Um, middle paragraph on the left hand side of page three and middle of that paragraph, I've got a sentence highlighted. Bus bars can be a standard size or customized. A couple sentences. Standard sizes are, are usually made of silver plated or tin plated copper or tin plated aluminum. That's the bus bars. That's what bus bars are normally made out of. Um, nothing in switchboard frame heating or low voltage spacing requirements. Um, nothing in those, but as always, like you guys can read through those. Uh, page four, um, you're going to have switchboard frame heating guidelines. You're going to have a question come out of table one um, from the module review. You'll have a question come out of table one, so make sure you mark that one. Um, cable bracing. So um, if you've ever seen something go over current or have a short circuit or a ground fault, you might have noticed like like a something jumped um, like something moves whenever whenever a circuit breaker has a trip like there's a there's a force um, that happens and um, the more voltage and the more current that you're passing through something the more that something can move so so this stuff has to be braced and insulated um, so that there's not like a catastrophic come apart of switch gear equipment whenever whenever something bad does happen um, so on page five, cable bracing, like, um, your cables need to be braced whenever they're entering switch gear, um, so that they're not going to move if something were to happen. Um, on the right hand side of five, right below that note, I've got an online test question. So you'll only see this in the book. The cable restrictions for a line to line or a line side bus include the following. I've got the second bullet point highlighted. If cabling is required, 800 amp minimum busing must be used. So if cabling is required, 800 amp minimum busing must be used. 120 switch gear. Um, remember, like you need to know what switch gear is. It redefines it there in the first sentence. But my, my highlight is the sentence before the bullet points. Switch gear performs two basic functions. 
and then the first two bullet points are highlighted. Provides a means of switching or disconnecting power system apparatus. It also provides power system protection by automatically isolating faulty components. Switchgear construction. One, two, one on page six. Second paragraph, last sentence. Metal clad switchgear enclosures are divided into three sections. The front section, the bus section, and the cable or termination section. So your bus section usually, in my experience, is run over top. The cables come out the bottom, and then you have um, the front section, like the part that you can get to in, inside the, the um, inside the MCC room and stuff like that. Um, so you can see right there on page six, um, they can switch it up and stuff, but you can see how like in the middle, they have the, the switch gear panel with all the buttons and the arms to charge the circuit breaker or switch gear. Um, and then above and below, they have panels to open up to do either your cabling or your bus bars. Um, if I had to guess, I think those the, the bus bars run through the top of that and the cables run out the bottom. Um, and then that's usually how I've seen stuff um, in the places that I've worked. Um, control and metering safety standards. Uh, nothing highlighted in this short little section, but they will have, usually a lot of these panels will have um, some sort of indication. They used to have like analog meters on all these. Um, I worked at Goodyear, that was an older plant. They still had a bunch of the analog meters on the front to say how much amperage this is currently using. Um, if you look on, back on page six, um, you can see the little white panel. So this has become more and more um, of a digital technology where you're going to have like a little computer screen or um, just a little screen that's telling you what it's doing rather than analog meters. One, two, three, wiring system. Um, so how, how these are getting wired up. Um, so the first set of bullet points are the restrictions in the wiring system. You might want to highlight the that sentence before wiring. Wire harnessing is generally used within the switchboard within with the following restrictions. And I have the third bullet point highlighted. Wire ties must be applied to the hard harnessed wiring every three to four inches with self-adhesive cable ties spaced at every 12 inches. That's all I've got for this um, page, flipping over to page eight and nine. Um, metering current and potential transformers. So, um, Nothing highlighted in those. Um, it'd be worth reading through that little short section. Um, I guess it says CTs and PTs will be discussed later in this module. Um, but they're just used for where you're using fusing and stuff like that in the panel. Um, nothing in switchgear handling storage and installation. Um, obviously, this needs to be in a, in a cooler, dry area. Um, can't be wet at all. Um, like all, like it has to be in like, not a clean room, but, um, not out on, usually not out on the factory floor. <laughs> medium voltage, lim medium voltage limiting switches, one, three, zero, uh, ratings. Ratings for switches include the following. I've got the second bullet point, the basic impulse insulation level, which is the maximum voltage pulse in kilovolts that the equipment will withstand. The maximum voltage pulse in kilovolts that the equipment will withstand. And then the fourth bullet point is also highlighted, withstand kilovolt or KV. The maximum 60 hertz voltage that can be applied to the switch for one minute without causing insulation failure. I have a bunch of other ones. Um, to note for ratings of medium voltage switches, but it's very similar to the low voltage switch 
switches. Um, they have the variations, uh, vari variations of switching, so they can be upright, inverted, uh, fused, duplex, selector, motor operated. Um, I've seen a lot of companies going more and more to motor operator switches. That way the person's not standing in front of the panel whenever it's um, charged or, or closed. One, three, three, four, and five and six. I do not have highlights in, but it's worth it's worth reading. So like opening operation, closing, maintenance. I talked about a little bit where you're where people have to like. It's not something that um, it's usually a secondhand company that's coming in to maintenance these things. Uh, but opening and closing, like that's where you're gonna wear the big. The big art flash suit with the big hood, like the big alien looking hood, uh, to go in and open and close those. Uh, page 11, bolted pressure switches. Bolted pressure switches, 140, page 11. Um, I've got the second sentence highlighted. They are often used instead of circuit breakers because they are inexpensive and can handle higher available fault current. So you can see a picture of that. Um, and figure six at the bottom left of page 11. Uh, ground fault 141, first sentence of ground fault. Ground faults exist when an unintended current path is established between an ungrounded conductor. Remember, ungrounded conductor, that's your hot, and a ground on a solidly grounded surface. So these happen quite a bit whenever somebody's dropping, if somebody drops a, a screwdriver or something in, in live switch gear which could go from line to ground and cause a ground fault. Phase failure 142, first sentence is highlighted. If a phase failure relay is installed, it will cause a trip of the bolted pressure switch if a phase is lost. This could occur if a tree limb knocks a line down. So if one, one phase goes out, it's gonna knock out the other two, which is it's good because it'll, it'll keep amperage from spiking. Um, nothing in the blown main fuse detector, a little two or three sentence section, flipping over to, um, maintenance, um, they go through the maintenance on these, but again, um, this is usually, usually has been done in my experience from a, a third party. Um, you can read through this stuff if you want. I don't have any highlights on pages 12 and 13. Um, but it is good to note, like looking at page 13 and the prote protective grounding uh, arrangements, um, you can see those grounds that are, are tied those three legs together. Um, and that's that's a safety thing. Um, you might see those um, like when we have power and stuff out down here in South Louisiana, you might notice those out on power lines and stuff. And that's to keep the linemen safe, make sure nobody's backfeeding with the generator or, or something along those lines like they are grounding. Um, grounding out power lines, you can ground them out in a box or ground them out on the actual power lines or, or different places, but it's just mostly a safety thing. Flipping over to 14 and 15, going into transformers. Um, transformers, I feel like are pretty easy because there's, there's no moving parts. Um, they're literally just changing voltage from one thing to another most times, um, all the times. Um, but they go through transformer theory. I don't, I don't have anything in transformer theory. We've gone over that in the past. Uh, transformer nameplate data, 152. Um, on the right-hand side of the page, the bigger section of bullet points, um, I've got the following are some transformer nameplate ratings and their classifications. Um, if you look about a little over halfway down, I've got the class bullet point highlighted. So the class of transformer. Um, Transformers are classified by the type of cooling they employ. Um, for the, the majority is either going to be oil filled or air cooled. Um, so you have an air cooled transformer, but like the transformer at your house is called a um, just has like a big pot of oil with the windings that are inside of it. Um, but you might see like an air cooled transformer at work, and, and these are um, these are going to hum a little bit louder. Um, they're going to run a little bit hotter, but I, th I think the advantage of those are they, they're cheaper. Next bullet point is temperature rise. The temperature rise rating is the maximum elevation above ambient temperature that can be tolerated without causing insulation damage. 
not really anything to say on that. The immediate next bullet point, first sentence of that next bullet point is highlighted capacity. The capacity of a transformer to transfer energy is re related to its ability to dissipate the heat produced in the windings. That's what you need to know out of the capacity section. Flipping over to page 16, still in the same uh, section. Uh, page 16 also has that picture of that dry, dry type transformer. So you can see in like they have big um, ventilation ports and you can actually see into those with the flashlight and stuff. Um, but last paragraph before 153, um, first sentence of that last paragraph. Although there are some overlap between power and distribution transformers, a transformer that is rated at more than 500,000 or 500 kVA and or 34 5 kV is generally a power transformer. So anything more than 500 kVA, transformers are, relate, are rated in kVA, so anything more than uh, 500 kVA is considered a power transformer. They go through the section of the dry transformers, air cooled, which is worth to the top, um, sealed dry transformers. Um, these are not ones that I've had experience with, um, but I do have a highlight. Um, if you look over on the page 17, they, they have the different tests that are done on, on these transformers. And the last bullet point, heat scanning. I have highlighted the heat scanning after the transformer is energized. The heat scan should be done to detect loose connections. So looser the connection, the more the more amperage it's going to be at that connection, the more heat that's going to be generated. So they can see those with like an infrared camera. Instrument transformers 155. I've got the second sentence highlighted. In order to reduce voltage and currents to usable levels, instrument transformers are employed. In order to reduce voltage and currents to usable levels, instrument transformers are employed. <clears throat> the last paragraph on page 17 is highlighted. The standard output voltage of potential transformers is either 120 volts 69.3 volts depending on whether the primary winding uses phase to phase or phase to neutral conductions connections page 18 still talking about instrument transformers on page 18 second paragraph last sentence is highlighted the secondary of a current transformer is usually designed or for a rated current of 5 amps So you can see how PTs and CTs are used um, for power metering. You can see how it's actually designed into um, that's what's reading the the, the power across these um, these lines of of electricity is current transformers and potential transformers. Um, Still so talking about instru instrument transformers, page 18, right below that warning, first sentence is an online test question. The primary considerations in current transformer design are the current carrying capability and saturation characteristics. <clears throat> the primary considerations in current transformer design are the current carrying capability and the saturation characteristics. Next paragraph, first sentence is highlighted, current transformers are manufactured in four basic types. Uh, oil filled, for example, the donut, bar, window, and bushing. Separate highlight is the next sentence. The bushing type transformer is normally applied on circuit breaker or power transformers. So you can see those on page 19. It's just different windows for the wires to pass through based on what it is. Like the window type might be used um, for bus bars. The bushing type um, for having wires going through them um, or the donut type um, as well for having a wire go through that. But like I said, like these work the same principle as, as like an um, ammeter. An ammeter just obviously can open, open that, that bushing up.
160 panel boards. Moving on to pages 21 or 20 and 21. Um, you can have your, your panel schedule um, on page 20. You can see all those, like the different panels, 1 through 15, where they are, what the main is. So it looks like um, a lot of the first ones are 100 amp mains, all the way up to the bottom one, which is a 600 amp panel. So it tells you number of circuits, breaker ratings, number of poles, and what it's for. Um, so you see the first 10 or, or lighting lighting panels, LDPs. Um, 162, identification of conductors. First, um, I guess that's only one sentence. First sentence is highlighted. The ungrounded conductors may be any color except green or green with a yellow stripe, which is reserved for grounding purposes only, or white or gray, which is reserved for grounded circuit for the grounded circuit conductor. Um, this is for number six and smaller. Out to the side of, of that, I wrote for number six and smaller. Number six and smaller. Um, is for the white or gray, which is reserved for the grounded conductor. So grounded conductor, neutral. Ungrounded conductor, hot. Okay, Moving on to page 22, number of circuits. So you can see um, 15 and 16 has two different uh, diagrams of panels, um, and you can see the different circuits that are on those. Um, and it's going to talk about sizing circuits for panels. My first highlight in 163 is the third sentence, third, fourth sentence. When using a three phase supply, the incremental number is six, a pull for each of the three phases on both sides of the panel board. This means that the that poles can only be specified in multiples of six. So for three phase, you have to go in multiples of six. The last sentence in that section is an online test question for new construction it's recommended you provide at least 20 percent spare poles 20 percent spare poles so that means you got to have 20 percent of the panel that's empty um, 164 panel panel board protective devices the sentence couple sentences first two sentences of the paragraph after the bullet points are highlighted the choice of the overload protection is based on the rating of the panel board. The trip rating of the circuit breaker cannot exceed the amperage of the capacity of the bus bars on the panel board. If you, the capacity of the circuit breaker is higher than the bus bars, the bus bars are going to have too much heat and the, the coating and stuff is going to come off of them. It's all like the, has to be coordinated just like we've talked about in the past. Nothing on 23 um, or 24. Like 24 has a 165 brand circuit protected device. That's like your, that's your breakers. So you've got six questions on page 25 um, to do. I'm going to continue on in the chapter. Um, installation requirements. The only trade term I have in this is branch circuit. So I'm going to read it. A set of... Um, Conductors that extends beyond the last overcurrent device, breaker, fuse, circuit breaker, fuse, something like that, um, and low voltage system of a given building. NEC requirements, electrical installation requirements. So they, they're going to go through, I mean, this 26 and 27 is pretty much all bullet points. It's got a lot of sections to the NEC um, that you might use, but I only have one highlight in pages 26 and 27. Um, again, interrupting rating is going to be one of the most uh, important, but the highlight that I have is on the right hand side of the page in the third to last bullet point markings. I have the second sentence of the markings bullet point highlighted. Per NEC section 110.24, field marking of service equipment shall indicate the available fault current, the date the fault current calculation was performed. So you have to have 
how much fault current can this handle when that was calculated. Page 27, um, they talk, like you can see the little case history down there. It looks like, looks like a, um, unused, they had an unused, unused opening that was left uncovered and a mouse or a rat got in there and went across, um, either across phase to ground or phase to phase. And that's, that's a lot of money in, in, in fixes in there. So, um, cover up those holes that you aren't using. Nothing highlighted on page 27. Uh, going into page 28, um, tap rules. Just know that that the tap is is where you're connecting to the bus bar usually, like where you're getting where you're getting power from. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to read section 213 if you don't know what a tap is. 214 grounding requirements. Um, everything's gonna have grounding requirements. The top right of page 28 electrodes. I've got the first sentence of electrodes as an online test question online test question first sentence of electrodes and you see sections 250.52 and 3 require that when a rod or pipe electrode when rod or pipe electrodes are used they must extend a minimum of eight feet into the soil eight feet into the soil requirements for switchboards and panel boards um 408 NEC 408 covers those um, and they have the requirements as follows in the bullet points I have the first bullet point I guess just the first sentence of the first bullet point on page 29 highlighted phasing NEC section 408.3 E1 states that AC phasing and switchboards must be arranged ABC from front to back top to bottom or left to right when facing the front of the switchboard switch gear or panel board the next sentence i do not have highlighted but i, I should have in systems containing a high leg like high, high leg 208 uh, the b phase must be um, the conductor having the higher voltage so b phase would be your high voltage usually marked with with orange electrical tape or wire or some per insulation 220 electrical diagrams of distribution equipment um, you can see all the abbreviations uh, right there on the right hand side of the page. I've got the sentence before all the abbreviations highlighted. The following abbreviations are used to represent meters. I've got this CRO. CRO is for an oscilloscope. So that would, that would um, be an abbreviation for having an oscilloscope somewhere. Then I also have the pH or phase meter um, highlighted as well. Um, nothing else highlighted on page 29. Moving on to 30, still in the same section. We've got um, it shows some diagrams and stuff like that, and, and you guys should should be familiar with those, like with the control relay or normally open or normally closed contact symbol. You guys by by now should be familiar with those. Um, my highlight on page 30 is right above 221. It's the third to last sentence or middle sentence in that one last paragraph before 221. Non-standard abbreviations will typically be defined in the diagram notes or the legend. Usually the legend. Legend is where you go first whenever you don't know what something is. 221, single line diagrams we've talked about in the past but it just shows the interconnections between different pieces of equipment where one line can represent many lines um, in there. No highlights in those. Elementary diagrams, again, nothing, uh, nothing in there. Interconnection diagrams, two, two, three. First paragraph, last sentence is highlighted. These drawings show all electrical connections within an enclosure, which each wire is labeled to indicate where each end of the wire is terminated. So those make it the easiest whenever you're wiring stuff up. They're going to have different types of connection diagrams. Flip, you flipped over to page 32, you can see a single line diagram. Um, figure 24 shows an elementary schematic diagram. 
and then 25 shows a point to point connection diagram usually yep um, connection diagrams 224 first sentence of 224 is highlighted uh, the connection diagram shows the internal wiring connections between the parts that make up an apparatus connection diagram shows the internal wiring connections between the parts that make up an apparatus so that's 224 first sentence 225 manufacturing excuse me drawings you're going to have just the bullet points are, are what um, would be good to know that's in the manufacturer's drawings it's always nice if you can keep the manufacturer's drawings with the equipment forever um, Go laminate those things and and, and keep them because once something gets 10 years old it's, it's hard to find the the way it was originally wired up um, which is needed quite a bit so you're going to have the title sheet general notes floor plan one line diagram schedule wiring diagram catalog sheet all that stuff's going to help uh, whenever stuff goes wrong with that equipment later on later on in the future um, shop drawings and as built drawings um, these are just more rough drawings of um, of pieces of equipment that are that are mostly um, just easy to read for the maintenance personnel or whoever the installation technician is. Uh, no highlights on 34 and 35 um, or 36, but it is good to. It wouldn't be a bad thing to try to read through some of these schematics and just uh, just take note of of how um, stuff is connected and whatnot. Um, but you should be um, doing the motor motor control lab for whatever semester you are in um, will help you with the with the motor diagrams and stuff like that so you got section 2 review on page 37 um, there's a good picture of a MCC room right there on um, page 37 with the R flash rating um, on there and it's got the date for whenever they figure that out so I know we've talked about those R flash stickers in the past but those are going to have to be on all pieces of electrical equipment. Section three, which I think is last section, testing and maintaining switch gear. <clears throat> so again, I've talked about how, um, in my experience, the, the testing and maintaining has been done by a third party, um, but there is ways to make checks and stuff like that. If, to see if the switch gear is good or bad or, or whatnot. General maintenance guidelines, they go through um, a couple different uh, steps for the visual inspection uh, to clean the switchboard. Um, so like that's that's making sure like stuff is, is cleaned out. Like um, ironically, that's one of the things I got in trouble for a good year because it was a union plant. I was wiping down the exterior and got yelled at because that wasn't my job. Um, but always good to have clean stuff. Um, equipment operation, megger test. So you can megger these. I've talked about what meggering is in the past, um, but it's just um, pushing high amounts of voltage to see, make sure that the ins it's an insulation test. So you got steps one through four. In step four, I highlighted the first sentence. Use a thousand volt megger to check the phase to phase and phase to ground resistance. That's inside of a switch gear. You're using a thousand volt mega to check the face to face and face to ground resistance. 39, you're going to have a question come out of table two. Um, just know that for a section review, you're going to have a question come out of table two. Test guidelines. I've got figure 30 at the bottom left highlighted. You need to know what an infrared imager looks like. Um, those are high dollar, but they can be used um, for for transformers, for motors. Um, I've used them for air compressors, like finding hot spots. Like though, that is a very useful tool to have um, available to you. They're very expensive, but if you can get your company to um, buy one or have one on site, it, they're nice to have. It's, it's a nice troubleshooting technique, even for you, we're talking about distribution equipment here, but you can also shine it on a pipe. And if, if you're in instrumentation or 
Um, can't figure out why a motor control valve isn't working, like shining it on a pipe somewhere that you can't necessarily get to, and the two sides of the pipe are, the, mo the, the valve might be showing open, but the two sides of the pipe are different temperatures showing that it's closed. Um, very, very useful tool in troubleshooting and maintaining equipment. But you should know what they look like uh, and what they are. So I highlighted figure 30 at the bottom left. At the top right of the page, they have, um, this is more about the infrared uh, surveys. The, so the negative test, test results um, would be the following bullet points. And I've got the last bullet point right above 322 highlighted. Temperature gradient of 16 degrees Celsius. Key in on that 16 degrees Celsius and above indicate a motor deficiency. Secure power and repair as soon as possible. So if you have temperature gradients of 16 degrees Celsius, remember that's Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Um, it's going to be quite a bit of quite a bit of a jump in, in Fahrenheit. Um, they go through the inspections for metal and close switch switch gear and switch boards. Nothing else highlighted on page 39 or 40. Um, these are just about doing visual inspections and testing. Um, you can read through the, these if you want. 323 three, low voltage cables, doing inspections on those. And then testing, medium voltage, uh, doing visual inspections, metal enclosed in, in busways, doing inspections. You're going to have a question come out of table three at the bottom of page 41. Uh, just know that for the section review. Nothing else highlighted on 40 and 41. 42. Um, metering and instru instrumentation. Again, they talk about how to do a visual and mechanical inspection. Nothing to highlight in there. Ground faults, 330. 331, ground fault monitoring system. First sentence of 331 is highlighted. Ground fault relays are used to protect equipment against ground faults. The immediate next sentence and three bullet points is a separate highlight. The three basic methods of sensing ground faults include the following. Ground return method residual method, and the zero sequence method. So they go through, kind of go through each one of those different methods. They have the sensing operation, nothing highlighted in that for me. Zero sequencing, 333, again, nothing highlighted. Relay mounting um, for these ground fault uh, sensors. The first sentence in 334 is highlighted. The ground fault relay should be mounted in a vertical position within an enclosure with the terminal block at the lower end. Connections, 335. Uh, I've got the sentence right about dead in the middle highlighted. Wires from the ground fault relay to the trip coil should be no longer than 50 feet and no smaller than 14 gauge wire. That's that's a safety thing. Like it has the signal has to get there fast enough um, so that's why there's no attenuation in the line. So less than 50 feet, no smaller than 14 gauge. They have settings, nothing highlighted in settings, ground fault system test, more tests um, that you guys can just read through, um, but no highlights in those. And that is all for this chapter. Um, so those are all my highlights. So as always, if you're, if you're in this class um, or doing my class, you've got all the section reviews to complete, the module review to complete, and the supplemental exercise as well as your practice test um, for distribution equipment. Uh, that is all for the distribution equipment module.